Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us today for the launch of the Think20 policy paper, uh, Targets and Indicators for a Meaningful Implementation of the European Green Deal. My name is Maria Cortes Puig, and I am the Vice President of Networks at the Sustainable Development Solutions Network, the SDSN. Um, the annual Sustainable Development Report that was released this past Monday uh, showed for the first time since the adoption of the SDG, um, a, 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 recline, a, a decline in a progress towards achieving these goals. Um, and this decline in performance uh, globally is driven to a large extent uh, by increased poverty rates and unemployment. Also, we now know that despite the pandemic, global, global greenhouse gas emissions actually increased last year. And the global mean surface temperature is already at 1.2 uh, degrees warmer than the pre-industrial uh, baseline. The COVID pandemic has uh, provoked not just a global health emergency, but also a sustainable development crisis. So the six could not be higher for the SD the sustainable development community. And while recent policy commitments from major economies, including the EU, um, are very encouraging, uh, namely uh, to achieve net zero greenhouse gas emissions by 2050, these commitments we know well are in themselves not enough. Um, the challenge of sustainable development is enormous. It requires an exercise of long-term policy making, which is something that collectively we're not great at. And it's highly complex. It involves all sectors and activities. Now, the European Commission has taken an additional bold step forward to materialize these commitments by launching a year and a half ago, the European Green Deal. It's one of the first comprehensive plans to achieve sustainable development. It's an ambitious coordination of strategies, consultations, law, budgets, and diplomacy that connects many themes ranging from energy to transport to food and industry. Today, we're going to discuss uh, this paper that uh, outlines the next essential step forward to lay out concrete quantitative targets. We know that concrete quantitative targets are essential to make progress. And these targets need to shape the actions of all relevant sectors and activities in order to guarantee that we're all swimming on the right direction. Measuring progress towards these targets will also be an essential step forward. And it will require a coherent set of indicators that are integrated into all policies. This is very important to harmonize and to make coherent the European Green Deal with the European semester, with the recovery and resilience plans, and ultimately with any SDG implementation strategy. As the policy paper that we're presenting today states, uh, having this enhanced monitoring framework with clear targets and coherent indicators will help the EU and also governments at all levels make sense of the many strategies and policies, allowing them to track progress and to cor correct course if necessary. And in fact, this is very much in line with what the European Parliament st stated two days ago, referring specifically to the eighth Environment Action Program, uh, the members of parliament stated that this should be an ambitious high level strategic tool to guide EU's environment policy to 2030, encompassing actions and targets of the European Green Deal and the Sustainable Development Goals. They underline the need to monitor and to evaluate progress of the EU and of the member states towards achieving these uh, priority objectives. A solid monitoring framework is also a very good accountability tool. The EU has committed to the SDGs and to net zero by 2050. And the EU is also making available to our countries a historic recovery funds. So we as citizens also need to know whether or not we're on track. And we, we need to demand that these strong European strategies that have been designed, such as the biodiversity strategy, the, the farm to fork strategy, are in fact being enacted.
Let me say a couple of words about Think 2030 that was launched by IEP and its partners in 2018. It's an evidence-based, sorry, nonpartisan platform uh, of leading policy experts from European think tanks, civil society, private sector, and local authorities. Today's event is the seventh of a series of breakfast uh, briefings that kicked off uh, in March of this year to launch and discuss the papers that came out of the second edition of the Think 2030 conference held in November of last year. All of the publications are available on the Think 2030 website. So let me give the floor now to the first speaker, the, the one of the lead authors of, of the paper that we're presenting today. Uh, Céline Charveriad has been the executive director of the IEP since 2016 and has more than 20 years of experience in the field of sustainable development. Céline started her career as a researcher at the Peterson Institute and the Inter-American Development Bank uh, in Washington, D.C focusing on poverty, social protection, and natural disasters. Celine then worked for 10 years at Oxfam International as a researcher on poverty and international commodities, and then as an advocate on trade and climate change issues. Um, Celine is a member of the European uh, Commission's high-level expert group, ESIR, the Economic Social Impacts on uh, Innovation and Research. And uh, she's also a member of the Assembly of the Soil, Health and Food Horizon Europe mission. She's currently also a member of the European chapter of the Club, Club Rome and the Strategic Advisory uh, Council of IDRI. Most recently in 2020, she was listed uh, in the top 100 CSR influence leaders by Ascent Compliance. Um, Celine, over to you. I'm just going to ask our, our participants that they use the chat function to introduce themselves like uh, they're already doing and the question and answer um, function to ask their questions throughout uh, the panel and the presentations. Thank you very much. Celine, over to you. Thank you, Maria, for the very kind introduction. Very excited to be here uh, to discuss with you the issue of target indicators for meaningful implementation of uh, the European Green Deal, representing uh, IEP uh, as a sustainability think tank. So the first thing to say is we have a, one of the first key challenges that I would like to, uh, to uh, point out to. Can you see my slides, by the way? Yes, we can. You may want to um, make it uh, a full presentation. I think, is it good now? There's it's a it's good enough, more. yes. Because in mine, it's, it's showing it as a slideshow. So hopefully it will appear like that for everyone soon. So the first thing to say is we have a challenge about targets. If you look at the right side of the screen, um, you can see the results of a survey we conducted with uh, 300 experts about how science-based are the different proposals. Celine, uh, sorry to interrupt you. Uh, we're not seeing the second slide. We're still on the first. And I think it might be because we're seeing not the slide show, but the, the presentation show. So yeah, let's, I, I, I think there's a delay because of the internet. Let me, let's try again, but. There we go. Yeah, okay. Perfect. Thank God. Thank you, Eloise. <laughs> um, so, um, so on the right side, you can see uh, the outcomes of the survey that I just mentioned. Uh, the, and the fact that uh, over 300, um, uh, close to 300 experts said that, um, you know, they can see that uh, some of the proposals in the Green Deal are really science-based, but they have doubts over other proposals, especially, you know, farm to fork uh, is one that they uh, are highlighting as not being necessarily what science requires. And this really highlights the fact that we still have an issue in the Green Deal of a lack of target. And what we mean by targets are legally binding, science-based, covering all planetary boundaries, and of course, in addressing interdependencies. So while on climate, we've really made a, a really good step forward, 
uh, we have an incomplete set of targets and those need to be completed. And for us, it's a key foundation to a coherent long-term strategy uh, for the EU in line of, uh, with SDGs. And as you know, there is no strategy. So if we don't have a strategy, at least we should have targets because if you don't know where you're going, you're unlikely to get there. We all can also can see that there's a big imbalance between uh, targets covering the economic, the social and the environmental dimensions of sustainability. And we are particularly uh, worried about the lack of targets around health, well-being, equity, and instead, we have still what I would say are very ill-defined principles, leaving no one behind just transition, which can be interpreted in many different ways. And actually, I was quite struck by looking at the commission uh, assessment of the RRF plan of Portugal yesterday, when they say, well, the plan contributes to a just transition, but if you're not defining the destination again, what is the maximum level of inequality that they should be in a society or the maximum level of unemployment or of poverty in line with SDGs? It's going to be very hard to judge the just transition, whether the transition is indeed just. We also need to make sure that targets are taking into account spillover effects on third countries. And at the moment, they are not. That's why we are very much promoting, for instance, in circular economy, a material footprint target. And we also have the issue that if we don't have legally binding target that gets us uh, uh, further than 2024, when uh, the mandate of the commission will end, that the European Green Deal stops altogether. And clearly that would be a major problem. So recommendations and shining objectives of the uh, European Green Deal into legal obligations that go, would go well, well beyond 2024, it should read 2024 develop a comprehensive and coherent set of quantitative targets, but also harmonizing timelines, because it makes it very hard to evaluate policies when all the different timelines about targets, budget cycles, reporting requirements are not aligned one with another. We also put some suggestions in the paper, which are really a first contribution to the debate about what could those new targets be. So on climate, we already have really good targets, but we could go further. And we have some suggestions in the paper. I'm not gonna go into detail on them. The second element that I want to highlight is mobilizing industry for a clean and circular economy. We really highlight the fact that we need absolute targets based on material footprint or consumption footprint. And that until and unless we have that, and we're talking economy wide here, but ideally also after that sector by sector, we will not know we are, whether we are moving forward uh, in terms of having a truly circular economy. We might just do better recycling. That is not a circular economy. Then moving to farm to fork, um, this is really an area that is highlighted by experts as the trouble child of the European Green Deal. And it's quite worrying to see uh, uh, what's going on with the super trialogues and that we're still not getting there in terms of reforming the cap and that the farm to fork, which is you know, a very useful communication, is still lacking uh, uh, strength, is still lacking uh, legal binding uh, effects. And that's why we are proposing a, a number of, of targets uh, that you can see in the paper that would be translating the vision of uh, the farm to fork into something that is legally binding and therefore could finally put some disciplines on the CAP which within the CAP reform discussions, we've never been able to do sufficiently. Uh, now turning to indicators, um, you can see on the right side that what we, we would recommend, okay, we have three major legs, planet, prosperity, people. Uh, there are frameworks uh, attached to them. They really need to come together uh, with well-being and resilient being the North Stars, as we call them, bringing together the six priorities of the European uh, commission. So in the absence of an SDG strategy, we feel that at least putting well-being at the, in resilience at the center uh, would be what we need, because at the moment we have so many different indicator frameworks. Uh, we highlight them here. There's no clear hierarchy, there's no division of labor and synergies, because obviously we would want to see also synergies between pl planet, people and prosperity in terms of how we are monitoring progress, because sometimes there are trade-offs, sometimes there are synergies. But we really need to make sure there are cross-cutting indicators that allow us to ensure that, you know, 
uh, we don't have a stool that will fall over at some point because one of the legs is not uh, sound enough. So recommendations, headlines indicators uh, that must be developed covering the six priorities of the European uh, Commission. Um, the Green Deal indicator framework we feel needs to have two types of indicators, measuring distance to targets, once we have set those targets that are missing, and monitoring means of implementation. What we mean by means of implementation is making sure that we're putting in place the structures, the funding, the awareness uh, uh, campaigns, all the sorts of tools that um, in, in the UN framework we would call means of implementation. So we, we make sure that uh, the means are following uh, the, the, the destination and we can really see by 2024 whether those are in place because otherwise we're wasting so much time because we might have wonderful targets and that's been the case in the past, but uh, you, you are not actually having means of implementation to, to make those targets come alive. And we also think that obviously those indicators must be uh, uh, applied to all the different policy frameworks and must be guided by targets that are based on sustainability principles and the SDGs. We also talk about the fact that uh, the semester really is missing a sustainability scoreboard and we have several elements there to really cover what we would call a sustainable and well-being economy. And we also very much recommend to improve the health and social indicators in the semester. Um, in terms of means of implementation indicators, again, we are proposing uh, quite a few. Uh, and uh, this is, again, a first contribution to the debate that will be happening regarding the Eighth Environmental Action Plan, um, keeping in mind that there's a, still a bit of lack of clarity between what is an, a European Green Deal indicator set versus an AFAP indicator set. Then the final thing I wanted to talk about is that we see the implementation gap. Again, when we talked to experts, they were very clear. The problems are lack of commitment of member states to the European Green Deal agenda, an inadequate governance mechanism, which doesn't allow for a systemic approach in implementation, and also the fear that we are in multi-speed Europe with unequal progress and capacities across member states that really needs to be addressed. And this implementation gap is nothing new. It's already plaguing um, the, the acquis. Uh, and there are many studies to, to, to show that, and the EA has plenty to say about this. Even the semester recommendations are not well implemented. And what's striking from the survey, again, is that we still have among sustainability experts a lack of familiarity and awareness of the European Green Deal. If Sustainability experts don't know about the Green Deal, especially in what we said was especially public officials in member states. How are we expecting for the European Green Deal to be implemented? There's also an issue of lack of democratic ownership. Member states don't have to provide plans for the European Green Deal, which means that all the other elements that would allow for some support enabling uh, democratic discussions on the European Green Deal at the member state through European processes are not there. And last but not least, there's a big confusion now between what will be the process governing the assessment and the implementation of the resilience and recovery uh, plans and other processes. Uh, then uh, finally, our policy recommendations within this, we feel we need to have a strengthened accountability of the European Council, of the, the heads of state, of the, the member states, um, with an annual report on the progress of all member states against the six headline ambitions of the European Commission. Now we see we would love for this to be under uh, the concepts of well-being and resilience. And we would want also on the very good model that we will try out with the climate law to have an independent scientific advisory council to uh, make sure that uh, the report is science and evidence-based. We also talk about trickle up governance. So making sure that there's a take up of the green deal by civil society, local authorities, that means enabling with funding and other ways on the ground, deep demonstrations that we can learn from and scale up. Greater youth involvement in uh, processes regarding the European green deal. So we can ensure uh, intergenerational equity and obviously uh, aligning funding incentives and compliance mechanisms because again, all of those are not necessarily aligned and starting with the RF plant, which yet has another indicator set and yet has 
uh, other way to judge progress, which again makes it very hard because if you're judging funding in one way and structural reform and uh, targets achievement in another way, that makes it very difficult to make progress. So thank you very much. You can see all the references here and um, really excited to hear from the other panelists, uh, their thoughts. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Celine, for the wonderful uh, summary of the report that obviously we encourage all of our... I'm going to now give the floor to Jock Martin. Uh, he is the head of integrated assessments for sustainability at the EEA. He's responsible for the strategic development of integrated environmental assessment methods and products in support of European policies focused on sustainable development goals and objectives. From 1986 to 1991, he worked for the UK government on statistics for industrial production, GDP and overseas trade. And he has been involved in environmental statistics, indicators and assessments since 1991 initially for six years at the Department for Environment in the UK, where he was an author of the first national indicator report on sustainable development. He was an EEA national fo focal point for the UK from 1991 to 1997. And since joining the EEA in 1997, he has been strongly involved in building capacities in the IONET, has designed EEA priority data flows and core indicators and has authored several integrated assessment reports. Um, Jock, over to you. Thank you, uh, Maria, and thank you, um, Celine and IEP for the uh, invitation to uh, be on the panel. Eh? Um, it's really interesting when you describe my history, how you mentioned the United Kingdom and being in the environment domain for 30 years. It seems like a long, long time. Eh? Um, however, I would like uh, uh, to share seven points uh, on the basis of uh, the proposal and uh, Celine's presentation. Eh? Um, and the first one is uh, to really uh, both uh, welcome the initiative, but also um, indicate that we're ready to contribute in, in different ways to the initiative. Eh? I think the initiative is very welcome because it has several dimensions to it, which are rather important for, from a knowledge perspective. Eh? And I will speak about knowledge. I won't speak so much about policy in my, uh, in, in my seven points. Eh? Um, so this idea of trying to have coherence um, across uh, objectives, across uh, sustainable development goals, uh, and so on, is really much needed, and it's not uh, something that features so uh, strongly in uh, current discussions. Eh? Um, the distance to target approach, um, it has some merits. I also have some comments later on, but it is very much uh, something that we need to, uh, to have focused on. The means of implementation, um, how do we enable change to happen, not just how do we describe uh, the uh, situation that we're in. And this idea of an annual report on a scientific advisory board or some uh, mechanism of that type, uh, very welcome. Eh? And from our side, you know, we've been working on indicators for all of the 25 plus years of the agency's existence. Um, but we have been over the last couple of years looking at how to revamp our indicators so that we're ready to respond to what we could foresee already in 2018, 2019, being a new policy agenda coming forward, uh, which we now have with the European Green Deal and so on. Eh? So we will launch a, a new website in, in September of this year, where you will see a, a rather different uh, approach to our indicators, sharper, communication focused, policy focused, um, and offering uh, both insights from our own assessment as well as uh, capacities for people to do their own assessments. Uh. Um, what I would like to say here in addition is that there are many new indicators coming on stream and things are moving quickly. Uh. And I think that's also relevant to this process that, uh, and many processes that we need to be more iterative and adaptive to how it is we can uh, accommodate changes that are happening. And one major change that we have in, in the agency is the um, data coming from Copernicus. And it's really informing a new type of indicator, a more timely indicator. So often, if you understand the environment domain, we have uh, a two, three year delay between when we present the indicator and the latest data for which that indicator can be represented. Eh? With Copernicus, we can uh, reduce that to five months. Eh? 
Um, so it does change the discussion and it does enable us to lift the environment climate dimensions up alongside the economic and social dimensions of sustainable development more clearly. Yeah? Um, so I think that the, um, the, the potential there is really big. And if you understand our DPSIR framework, driving forces, pressure, state impact response, there's a high prevalence currently of indicators on the D, the P and the, and the R not so much on the S and the I, and Copernicus is going to change that situation. So I think we'll be able to also be more responsive to the six objectives beyond um, uh, beyond climate uh, with these developments. The second comment is um, to uh, indicate that because we're confronted by systemic challenges and the need to transition towards um, sustainability, through the uh, changing these key systems uh, of production and consumption. We need to think uh, a little bit differently about headline indicators and how they sit in the overall uh, story. Uh, so I, uh, I'm just making a suggestion that we should also be thinking about headline insights because often we're somewhat uh, restricted by what the indicator is telling us, whereas in a systemic context, we should use the indicator to help us tell a broader story. Yeah? And narratives and insights uh, become uh, quite uh, useful in that regard in our um, uh, most recent experience. Yeah? A third comment is with respect to the distance to target. Um, we've done work in this ourselves, and it's acknowledged in the paper when we uh, did monitoring of the seventh environmental action program. Uh, there is an issue that, that's um, interesting in the coming period, which is speed. So to what extent can we imagine that in trying to present a distance to target, uh, we often present a quite linear um, uh, perspective on that? Could we bring in the element of speed? Uh? And just to give an example, if you look at the greenhouse gas emission reductions, that we uh, achieved in the period in the 30 years 1990 to 2020, then, um, and, and you look at what we need to achieve in the 30 years 2020 to 2050, we need a, an almost three times increase in speed of reduction. Huh? And I think that's really interesting to um, think about how can we introduce the element of speed and urgency into the distance to target um, approach that's proposed. Huh? And I'll come with a further uh, insight on that in, in, in my next point, which is that this means of implementation, um, which is a very welcome uh, focus of this uh, proposal, we talk about enablers of uh, transitions to sustainability. We talk about more solution-oriented indicators as opposed to the, the prevailing indicators, which are more problem-oriented, particularly in the environment and climate side. Huh? Um, so here, when we think about this speed issue, should we also think about when we're looking for the means of implementation to dig more deeply beyond the headlines into the data that we have? Huh? So for example, if you take the greenhouse gas emissions inventory, we have lots of detailed information about economic sectors contributing to the overall uh, picture. Huh? If we apply the nearly three times increase in speed to those, what kind of insights would it give us to um, the more means of implementation perspective? How could we link those insights to the uh, policies and other initiatives that we have to support um, the means of implementation? And therefore, how could we um, start to make links between the more detail that's underneath the um, the headlines to these uh, to this uh, means of implementation. Huh? A second um, aspect that could be useful to pay more attention to at, at the more detailed level is that we do know that certain data sets like greenhouse gases are better established than other data sets biodiversity. Um, but we also know that quite a number of the sub elements of the greenhouse gas emissions inventory directly relate to biodiversity impacts, huh? for example, agriculture and forestry. So could we then look at both the speed that needs to change there and how that can relate to the other environmental objectives, huh? as well as looking for improved indicators for those environmental objectives. Um, 
and I think there there's uh, some potential that we uh, will be looking at in the agency and would be very happy to discuss with others in, in, in a partnership in this process. Huh? Um, a further comment on this fourth point about means of implementation. There's a really nice piece of work uh, produced by um, colleagues in Cyprus under uh, Maria's network, uh, the European uh, Sustainable Development Solutions Network, which is really a good example of how it is we need to think when we want to bring more means of implementation solution oriented indicators to the table that um, the methods have to be different. Um, and the, the methods are more methods of scoring against different uh, implementation uh, actions and how it is to do that in a coherent way. Um, the Cypriot example shows a really nice uh, way of trying to do that methodologically in a way which could be applied across all countries. Huh? Um, my fifth point is that where would we, with, these, with this speed of development, so we have really an unprecedented speed in policy development, I would say. Uh, we have it in knowledge developments, um, particularly with respect to new data uh, streams. And we also have quite a lot of um, developments uh, at the methodological level. Huh? But we know that when you're trying to do more systemic type uh, indicators that the methods are lagging the non-systemic indicators and the methods used to uh, to develop those. Huh? So how can we develop in this perspective of 10 years to 2030 an iterative approach which allows us to maintain a clear communication of what's at stake but to change things over time because new things come on stream. Huh? And a couple of examples of things that I think will come on stream for example in the next two or three years. One is that we sorely lack a coherent sustainability measurement and an assessment framework. Huh? We have the SDGs, we have indicators, but we tend to make links between the two without necessarily applying a, a coherent methodological and assessment approach. Huh? So trying to develop one of those is, what, is an exercise in the agency with others, and that should come on stream in the next couple of years. Huh? A second one is very good work in JRC, which is linking between uh, consumption and production um, statistics and SDGs and planetary boundaries. Huh? Um, really interesting uh, potential in that work, but it is experimental and it does need to be uh, scaled up. Huh? So how can we accommodate that in, in the coming years in, in such uh, processes like this? Huh? Um, and the third example is that currently we have an economic model which is largely conditioned by the um, ideas of the 20th century. Yeah? So what I mean is that employment, uh, growth, um, the inflation, um, interest rates, these are the sorts of conditions within which we try to understand whether we have a model on the economy which is uh, meeting our needs or not. Eh? If we think about living within ecological limits, which we've been talking about for nearly 10 years now, we don't actually have the capacities in any country in Europe to be able to understand how the economy would transform within those kind of uh, conditions. Eh? So could we imagine if you take the planetary boundaries and you apply them into um, uh, the economic model, um, what that would mean for how things would change over time. Eh? Really interesting um, area of development and something that uh, needs attention, but how can we again give that attention and through these types of processes make sure that um, we're able to bring that sort of uh, information into into play. Yeah? My sixth and second last point is that I really welcome the uh, the annual report approach and the scientific uh, panel um, and I think there will be uh, some uh, we have uh, recently been asked to, to be the Secretariat for a Climate Change Advisory Board, and I think there could be some lessons transferred from one experience to another. Huh? Um, there is an issue, though, and I think it could be worth exploring, and I think Celine is touching on it uh, in, in what the, the paper is talking about. Um, and it is this broader stakeholder process. So science can offer a lot of um, support to such a process, but what about the stakeholders that we need to bring the uh, transition 
to its uh, uh, desired conclusion. Eh? Many of those stakeholders are not scientists, but they are players in the game. So how do we think about uh, the relationship to them in this process? And maybe there's some lessons from the World Economic Forum and how they, not so much what they do, but how they do it. And I'm all, I've always been intrigued for more than a decade now that whenever they have that forum, they publish this global risk report a week before, and it becomes a key kind of knowledge contribution to a very kind of uh, political stakeholder process. Huh? Um, my final point is the following. The, the uh, processes that we're developing here, and Celine mentioned it very clearly, we have a lot of processes going on. Um, and personally, I'm not against that because I think the more that we can have uh, initiatives and the more we can connect them and be coherent between them, the better because we're still rather not well understood in the, uh, in, the, in, in, in the public discourse, but we're much better understood today than five years ago, certainly. Yeah? But there is an issue with all of these processes and it does relate back to um, the countries because if we want to be engaging at the political level, then we need to show these uh, country comparisons and um, that will be relevant to people like Grace in the parliament, to people in the council and so on and so on. Huh? But we do have an issue in the European Union where with 27 members, five of them represent the vast majority of the population and the vast majority of the capacities that we have to develop environment, climate, sustainability knowledge. Huh? So how do we help the other 22? Huh? And how do we think then that the process like this and other processes can really help those countries um, that are uh, struggling somewhat um, to be able to respond to these uh, points that Celine makes in her presentation around the means of implementation and so on. Huh? And maybe that Cypriot example that I mentioned previously is a good one to, um, to think about that um, we can maybe uh, work out uh, a relationship with the countries that um, respects these realities and understands these uh, realities of very different countries across the European Union. So thank you. Um, I will stop here and um, pass over to uh, Maria. Thank you so much, Jog, and, and wonderful insights. Very, very interesting, this idea of how do we include the, the speed of, of change into our our evaluations. Um, I believe that we have Grace already in the line and so I'm just going to briefly introduce her. She is a member of the European Parliament from the south of Ireland and before enter entering politics, uh, Grace worked as an environmental activist with uh, Greenpeace for 20 years, 10 of which were spent at sea, including on board of the very well-known Rainbow Warrior. She's a trained ecologist and a former senator to the Irish Senate, where she served for three years before becoming a member of the European Parliament. In the European Parliament, Grace is a member of the NV and the, it's, it's the name and the PECH committees where her focus um, is the protection of the natural environment, both marine and terrestrial. She's the rapporteur of the eighth Environment Action Programme to 2030 that we've mentioned uh, a little bit ago. Grace, thank you so much. It's wonderful to have you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you very much for the introduction and um, my apologies. I have only just been able to join you and I'm very lucky to have got the tail end of Jock's uh, presentation, which um, it was br brilliant. And um, I always, uh, uh, the, the engagement Jock I've had with you has uh, been um, it always um, very inspiring and motivating. So I'm glad to have got that. And in fact, I was coming from that PECH PESH committee um, this morning. So I'm multitasking. Um, so firstly, I'd like to say congratulations to the lead authors of the report, to Celine and uh, Eloise, for compiling such an excellent policy paper that will serve as a very useful paper for policymakers like myself um, as we try to get serious about the implementation of the 2030 Sustainable Development Goals, or the Sustainable Agenda, in fact. Um, and uh, I just want to say at this point um, and to thank uh, Celine and Eloise for their huge um, support to me and my team, um, to me as Rapporteur of the eighth 
Environment Action Programme and my team of uh, Rose and, and Joe Sprackett, um, you were really uh, very supportive, very knowledgeable and uh, helped lead us in the process. And so what I'd like to do now is uh, react to some of the main policy recommendations and point how it fits in with the, my work in, uh, with the ATAP. Um, and and uh, first I'd like, to, I agree and I, I welcome all of the paper's policy recommendations and I look forward to sharing it with my colleagues in the European Parliament and beyond. I'm glad to say that the, the Greens uh, are part of the Irish government and um, we're in coalition there. So I will um, do my best to, to circulate the paper to um, as many points as possible. Um, so my reaction uh, overall to the paper. Um, so uh, regarding the overall message, the ambition of the European Green Deal might be redundant if not complemented with fit for purpose targets, indicators and governance frameworks. And I think there's no doubt about this, but there, uh, but there is no might be redundant. And um, I think we know uh, it will be redundant if we do not have fit for purpose targets, indicators and governance frameworks. These are vital. Um, and so, uh, you know, we can't just, we're at a point in humanity where we can't just um, uh, sit back anymore. And as Jock said, there is a, a there's a, an urgency now and um, it, the evidence is there to show us that speed is of the essence. And this is the decade um, uh, where uh, we call it the decade of implementation where we really do have to um, get a move on uh, because um, it, it just is, is critical. So I speak here today as a member of the Green DFA group in the European Parliament. And next week we'll be voting on a political agreement on the, Europe, uh, the EU climate law that we know in the, the Green EFA group is really not fit for purpose. Um, because it's not um, aligned with the science, with the evidence, or with the Paris Agreement. Um, and, you know, it's, it's hard um, sometimes to vote against things, um, you know, and, and, and it, there's a balancing act. But, I mean, we, it's not, it, it wasn't a flippant decision by us in the group. It is, a, you know, we really uh, considered it uh, at length. We considered it uh, across our members of the Green EFA group, but also, um, you know, uh, I have to think of it uh, in Ireland, um, where just last night, the climate bill um, passed um, through the, uh, the Dáil, so um, the lower house, uh, which is a great achievement. So how, you know, it's, it's really important for us, um, our messaging around uh, the climate law and the climate bill now in Ireland. But anyway, the message that our target must be fit for purpose uh, and not just targets for the sake of targets is one that needs repeating. And uh, so we don't want things to be sitting on the shelf gathering dust anymore. We need action. Um, the necessity for governance framework is also crucial, and we're reminded of this when we see the climate crisis fall down the agenda of UCO. Um, now, it fell down the agenda because we've been in a health, a global health uh, crisis with COVID, um, and we, you know, see at times um, foreign affairs crises jumping up the agenda. But to our mind, um, the ecological crisis and the sustainability agenda needs to be at the top of. It needs to be at the top. Uh, of all agendas all the time um, because in the end and simply put you know it's the the it's our life support system and if we uh, you know um, Jock mentioned the nine planetary boundaries if we start cutting off um, the the um, uh, the support systems that we need to survive um, as a species then uh, it's the end game. So uh, for, for me and for my group, always the ecological crisis is at the top of the agenda. Good air, good water, good uh, food. Uh, um, you know, all of these are, are critical for our, uh, our own existence and sustainability on this planet. So my reaction in terms of the specific policy recommendations in the paper um, in terms of policy, uh, policy recommendation one, 
the coherent set of targets and indicators. Um, I strongly agree with one coherent set of targets and indicators um, that they, that must be developed to define and measure progress towards our 2030 goals. And I have to say that distance to target and means of implementation were concepts I wasn't too familiar with until I had this, that excellent um, consultation meeting with uh, Celine and Eloise, Eloise um, when I was drafting the APAP report. Um, and the two concepts uh, I introduced into that APAP report, and I'm glad uh, that they have been kept in the report and they were adopted in the ND committee on Tuesday. So that was, uh, that's one hurdle uh, achieved. So distance to target and means of implementation are really important types of indicators for meaningful monitoring. And they're, they're not hard to grasp, but none of the shadow rapporteurs um, in the, the uh, eight EAPs process were familiar with concepts. So my team um, explained, you know, had to explain uh, what they are. And, um, and that'll just give you an idea how important it is um, to get uh, these concepts, as I, I say, into the hearts and minds of people. First, we have to get them into the minds and then let them uh, drop down into the hearts. <clears throat> but they're really important concepts. And to me, language is really important. Um, and um, uh, and their um, language gives meaning. And uh, for that reason, these concepts, um, hopefully we'll see um, them really embraced uh, now within the, the political uh, sphere as well. Um, and in terms of policy recommendation number two, to promote structural reform, um, etc. So laying down um, a sustainably, a sustainable well-being economy as the economic aim of the EU has been a prior priority for me in the EAP. And I was very pleased with the wording of the report adopted in the NV. So an NV being the Environment Committee. So Environment, Food, as you know, Public Health, Food Safety. Um, the, the, which, so, um, so the wording was uh, adopted on Tuesday and it had the following as one of the eight EAP's six thematic priority objectives. And, and read it, advancing towards a sustainable well-being economy that gives back to the planet more than it takes and ensuring that the transition to a non-toxic circular economy where growth is regenerative and resources are used efficiently in line with the waste hierarchy. Um, and this is not a new concept, of course, and all of you listening uh, will know that concept for, for, for a decade now anyway. Um, so, uh, but still at the same time, it wasn't easy to get support from across political groups so there's a need to wear, uh, raise um, this issue higher on the agenda and we need to normalize the term and I'm delighted to see it in the, the paper's recommendations. Um, so, so um, you know, I, I hear it even in Ireland in the, in the, at the top of this political sphere in Ireland. Now we're talking more about uh, sustainable well-being economy, sustainable development goals. These that lexicon is coming right into the language of the politicians, and that, that that's what we need. Then, in terms of policy recommendation three, turning objectives into legal ob obligations, I agree with the, that target, and it will inevitably be taken less seriously if they are contained in communications rather than laid down in law. So. This is critical that we get um, that they're laid down in law. Uh, so it's not all talk, talk, because we don't have time anymore. Um, given the scale of the ecological crisis for talk, talk, now we need the action. And it's very important that targets uh, laid down by the Commission strategies are met. Um, for example, that 30% protected areas in biodiversity strategy. Um, and uh, in the APAP, I inserted an important paragraph that ensures all targets and commission strategies will be monitored as part of the APAP monitoring framework. So the wording of that paragraph is the thematic priority objectives laid down in paragraph two shall be understood as covering the objectives, targets and actions set out in the European Green Deal strategies and initiatives, as well as the targets in union legislation that contribute to the achievement of these objectives. 
those objectives, targets and actions shall be taken into account when developing the monitoring framework for assessing progress towards the priority objectives of the ADAP. Um, and now uh, the, the policy recommendation four um, I want to speak about, and that's the annual report and, and conference to assess progress towards 2030 goals. Again, I strongly agree with this recommendation and would love to see it happen. In fact, I, I'd more than love to see it happen. Um, in the ATAP, it was priority for me to strengthen the monitoring framework to include a governance component. I'm happy that the ENVI committee voted to include an annual exchange by EU institutes to discuss progress towards the ATAP's objectives and crucially to identify corrective measures if we are not going in the right direction. And that is going back to what Jock was saying about the iterative process. I'm a, a great believer um, that the ecological crisis will absolutely, it, it's imperative that we recognize that we will have to move forward, adapt, iterate, you know, back, forth, back. So it means that, I suppose for me, it's an all hands on deck approach that we're really, um, you know, you're, you're moving a mechanism and if, if things aren't going the way um, that uh, they need to go, more than what, what we want, but the need to go, then we need to be able to go back, address it, and then, and then see what the, the uh, way forward is. So, um, and again, I agree with Jock that speed is of the essence. So we need to ensure an efficient iterative process so if a target is not reached, that we have a mechanism to address it speedily and have corrective action. And this is what accountability is all about. And given that this mandate ends in 2024, and this is really important, it's imperative that the next crop of policymakers continue on the path that we aim to set out. So the buy-in is really important um, uh, to, like critically important too. Um, and uh, again, just to go back to what Jock was saying, I mean, planetary boundaries are really important that the, the, that, that, um, the concept of planetary boundaries, that that moves out uh, into um, the educational systems, into all political systems, policymakers, all of that. So the people recognize that, that, that there are different types of boundaries that we can, and there are tipping points. And I always remember, you know, that the Montreal Protocol and the ozone layer in 1986, um, I had the, the opportunity to be in Antarctica with Greenpeace and we were, we sailed into Antarctica and we set up a base camp, um, World Park Antarctica, it was called, and it was to, and we left um, a group of scientists uh, on the Antarctic continent um, near, uh, just by the Ross Sea by Scots, um, where Scott, uh, the explorers thought is and the whole thing was to build evidence and monitor um, uh, do scientific um, monitoring in Antarctica to prove the importance of the conservation of that continent and um, so uh, you know that was just one boundary there's many boundaries and it's really important um, that we get that concept out there and I think that the children in schools and I've worked with the Heritage Council of Ireland and um, they, I've worked in schools for years uh, talking about environmental education and I think the children will love the concept of planetary boundaries you know and um, so I think that'll work well and then the other thing is um, the as Jake uh, Jock talked about the stakeholders and stakeholders is key as well and then again I think you know we're all in this thing together called life and um you know, if we don't, uh, again, that kind of uh, hands on, all hands on deck, and I mean, some are more active than others, but if we don't create the mechanisms um, to enable people to understand what we're talking about um, and the importance of education in that regard and that stakeholders, so, you know, in my world, there's no one's more important than another, um, you know, and we all have to pull together with this one because if we're going to uh, get out of this mess, uh, then we're going to have to, um, as I said, we're going to have to all be uh, working very hard and very much together. Um, and I'm a person of, of, of uh, you know, accused over the years of wearing the pink glasses. I'm an optimist. 
So um, I hope we will succeed. So thank you very, very much uh, for allowing me to speak and for this um, really important paper. And um, and once again, I'd just like to thank you, um, Celine and Eloise, for all of the uh, important uh, support you've given to me and to Maria for sharing. Thank you. Thank you so very much for for your insights. Uh, and, and also, it was wonderful to hear about your experience, uh, your previous experience. And, and you raised a very important point. I think with the, the pandemic has uh, made it very obvious how important data is uh, to manage any sustainable development crisis. But I think it has also brought about another challenge, uh, which is data education and, and, the, and, and making it not just available, but also uh, explain, explain it and make sure that the public is aware of what each uh, indicator means what its relevance is. Um, we have uh, several questions already in the chat as well as someone has raised their hand. So I'm just going to start with um, one question for you, uh, Jock, on the on the use of Copernicus data. Um, so there's someone asking in the chat if you could specify what kind of uh, uh, indicators you would you would be referring to when you say that we can have we, that we can go from a lag of two to three years uh, all the way to five months. Um, if you could give some examples of what kind of data you would be referring to. Yeah, thank you. Um, the I'll give one example uh, in the time available. Huh? It's um, uh, observations coming from satellites, which enable you to understand uh, a concept called soil moisture deficit which in normal language means how wet are the soils and how dry are the soils across Europe, eh, if you want to keep it simple. Eh? Um, and we're able to observe that from satellites for a 20 year period from 2000 to 2020 and uh, generate the latest year's data uh, by May of uh, the following year. Eh? Um, now that ind indicator is interesting in the sense that soils are this fundamental uh, bridge between how it is we produce food largely and how it is we manage uh, pollution into into natural systems. Eh? Um, so th and, and the moisture issue is a key function uh, that we, uh, we can observe to tell us a lot more than just what uh, the, the indicator itself tells us. Eh? So it's a good example of a systemic indicator and it's a good example of being able to draw th insights around it so we have the advantage of timeliness, but we also have the advantage of drawing um, a narrative around it, which is uh, goes beyond what the indicator itself is telling us. Uh, and that's much more for me, the future, uh, um, w when we're looking at these indicators. And just to uh, finish that, you know, when we started our uh, review of our indicators, we had 120. We decided to go to uh, 60 and, and, and build from there. Um, and today, Copernicus is nearly uh, is the source, uh, either primary or supporting source of uh, nearly fifty percent of those. So the game has changed, and it's changing quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to give the floor to Benjamin Claus. Uh, I don't know if you want to turn on your microphone and camera, perhaps, Benjamin. or else perhaps while he gets ready. Benjamin, yes. Do you want to turn on your microphone, Benjamin? Otherwise, while you get ready, I'm going to give the floor to Gianluca Spinacci. Gianluca, I think you can turn on your mic. Even your yes. camera. Good morning. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes. So I would like to uh, to join uh, Grace and Jack in the congratulations to Celine and Eloise for this report. It was really stimulating, and it was even more stimulating uh, uh, to hear the contribution comments uh, from both Jock and Grace. Uh, to which I would uh, would like to gra congratulate for the success of the vote in the in the MV committee. So I am an official uh, in the European Committee of the Regions, 
the Committee of the Regions uh, has established uh, a working group of uh, local uh, mayors and president of regions uh, on the Green Deal going local. And as it was uh, uh, underlined in this morning uh, debate, uh, we try to work across uh, the sector. So we work with all the commissions, the six thematic commission, uh, and uh, uh, also in the administration, I am um, a bit the coordinator, I'm the advisor on Green Deal, trying to bring together the economist with the sociologist and the environmentalist. Uh, the, the reason why I, I asked for the floor uh, is not just to, let's say, share this info with the colleagues, but also to um, signal that our plenary has voted uh, uh, in favor of uh, starting a process uh, of developing uh, uh, a, a scoreboard at regional level on the Green Deal. Uh, to be very uh, clear, we, want, uh, we don't want to, let's say, to create uh, a, an additional scoreboard. We would like uh, to join, uh, a, let's say, existing or in the making a scoreboard. And so the work that is already in place uh, can be complemented by the, this regional dimension for three reasons, basically. One, because uh, we think that uh, uh, if this transition is going to happen, we cannot just look at the five big member states, as the Jock said, but we have to look within uh, the member states. There are different dynamics. Uh, myself, I come from Italy, and there are so many different situations across the country and the same in other uh, countries. Second, because we feel that only looking at this you can engage with the stakeholders because the stakeholders, they don't look only at the national figures, but they look at their own local figures and their uh, local, let's say, speed of progress. And third, because it's a way to, um, to enable, as uh, Jock said, the, uh, the change maker, which are uh, those on the field, uh, not only, let's say, the mayors of the president of the region, but also the local uh, entrepreneurs, the local civil society. So um, we would like to continue this uh, after this, let's say, breakfast uh, exchange on bilateral uh, to see how concretely we can do. But I have a question, so that is really a debate to the panelists, to your experience, uh, how uh, this uh, local and regional dimension can be uh, brought forward in terms of uh, uh, data availability at uh, local level, because we, uh, uh, we encounter a bit the problem that Jock said. I mean, the Eurostat data are uh, basically uh, 20th century economic data, socioeconomic data, but they are not about the 21st century uh, uh, data that we need, but maybe with new technologies, including satellite and others we can uh, collect at uh, subnational level. Uh, so which is your experience on this? And which is the, the agenda that at political level we can build on it? Because we need, uh, uh, we need to convince those who are uh, in the statistical area to, uh, to work on this, to work on the subnational level of, uh, uh, of the Green Deal. Uh, clearly we are, uh, we are on this side, but we need to, to work with the commission, with the Eurostat, with the European Environmental Agency, with the think tank like yours, uh, and with all those uh, like-minded like you. Thank you. Thank you, Gianluca. Um, who wants to take the floor first? Celine, do you want to go ahead? Yeah, I can go quickly. Um, we have done some work uh, a few years ago on reviewing existing local sustainability indicators, which we can share. Uh, the other thing I wanted to say is uh, actually SDSN, and maybe Maya can speak to that more than me, but uh, has already uh, four cities put together a methodology for, for, for indicators and targets. Um, so I think there's also that that you could uh, could borrow from. And maybe there's also an opportunity we are part of an H2020 on socially inclusive decarbonization of cities that will just get started to make sure that you know we, we, we test and try to uh, invent uh, from the deep demonstrations we'll do within that, that project what, what could be indicators of success uh, for those deep demonstrations. So these are three ideas from me. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Celine Jock. I don't know if you, there was something that you wanted to add. 
I'll only add one point, and it is that I'm not convinced by the indicator perspective at the city level. Um, I'm more convinced by uh, uh, trying to understand what's at stake uh, when it comes to trying to achieve sustainability transitions at the uh, at the city level. Uh, um, and here, uh, uh, we I don't know if Gianluca has seen it, but we published some work just on, I think it was Tuesday this week, uh, yes. um, on um, the urban perspective. And it is really to try and take these objectives we have on circular economy, climate, biodiversity, uh, pollution, and so on, and try to describe how it is you can, by linking things together, arrive at a more effective starting point for implementation. Huh? Um, and I think there, you know, the the cities are rather well endowed with their own data. So I think they need to under, uh, they need help to understand how best to go about the implementation actions, not necessarily have uh, a lot of efforts towards indicators in itself. Huh? Um, more of an SDSN perspective, Maria, than an indicator perspective, I would say. Thank you, Jock. Um, Gianluca, I have add, I have included uh, in the in the chat the link to our latest report on cities for Europe. But this is a report. The, this methodology has been used at, um, in different countries. So for Italy, for Spain too. So we have a, a report for the for one hundred municipalities in Spain. And perhaps what's more important and going exactly in line with what Jock was saying is that these reports are mostly used to then work with cities and identify what are the systemic approaches that can be taken to, to, to the implementation of the SDGs rather than looking at specific indicators, but really looking at the, at the city as a whole. Um, Grace, would you want to make a, 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 is there anything you want to add on this question? Only, only that I going back to Jock's point that I'm, um, you know, the, you know, twenty seven member states and different the um, um, kind of the different uh, take up and the are the five uh, stronger countries um, is that you know in terms of of uh, sharing information and equity that we're moving together. I think it's really important that the um, Committee of the Regions has a, a role to play there very much so in trying to, to bring the information. I mean, I'll talk about Ireland. I mean, certainly since the Greens went into government, you see a lot more ecologists being hired into the local councils. And that's a start, you know, because at least they're, they're, they have the education and the thinking. Um, so that's something. So it's that, you know, getting the right people in the right place who can who genuinely uh, want to create the systemic change we need, but again, it has to be done. Um, there has to be some mechanism to do that. And uh, you know, even when Jock was talking, I was thinking of kind of climate equity. You know, equity across the board. So that uh, one of the aims of the the commission should be to make sure that the information is disseminated and the agencies and whatever disseminated in a way, but that there's a, a mechanism to make sure that there's take up and that then there's there's take up and and then there's uh, action as a result of that. Thank you. Those are those are great points. And indeed we need to create capacity at governments. Now we're seeing in many countries how they are recurring to international consultancies to help them figure out how to uh, plan their recovery and their reforms uh, because of that lack of capacity. Um, there's one question that uh, has uh, triggered some, some discussion in the, in, the, in the chat. And I think because we focused more on the environmental pillar, um, we haven't touched upon so much, but uh, Celine brought it up with uh, with her presentation, and this it's this idea of the of the just transition. Is that enough, uh, especially in a in a climate of growing inequality? This is also an area, uh, Jock, you were mentioning biodiversity, but inequality is also an area where indicators are not uh, not enough. We don't have a, a phenomenal metrics. 
how what are your thoughts about how how can we ensure that uh, while we are respecting the planetary boundaries and we're designing these these uh, recovery and resilience plans we go beyond just having a just transition but just target addressing inequality and addressing um, those that are already behind um, Celine I don't know if if you want to kickstart this Yes, sure. Um, well, I, I think first it, it's important to, to remind that we had a, a poverty target in the EU and it lapsed in 2020. Um, to my knowledge, it's not been replaced, although I haven't looked at the latest. And uh, we have, you know, obviously with SDG 10, uh, some clues as how we could be measuring and having a target on inequality. But again, this is missing. And for me, it's really important to have the destination because that's what defines your just transition path. Um, so, so I think we, you know, I always talk about a just ambition. We need a just ambition, and then we can design a just transition. Uh, the second thing is, is we still, and you know, EA has done fantastic work in in this to link really the um, inequality or socioeconomic data together with uh, data about um, uh, exposure to pollution or capacity to deal uh, with uh, or to have access to, to nature. So there's a fantastic report uh, from, from EA and I think we need to build much further on this so we can really see where, you know, in, in our mind, we need to put those furthest behind first. And sometimes we're still lacking the, the data and the granularity to make sure that then we can really tailor the investments and the actions to where the people are that are the most exposed, that have compounded vulnerabilities because they're also out of work, they have less access to health care systems, they have less access to nature. And we really need to put the interest of those people first. And, and also to see that some of these people are also concentrating in countries that Overall, you know, like in 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 uh, in, uh, in Central and Eastern Europe, more uh, exposed to the impact of air pollution. So, to me, it's really key to make the Green Deal people-oriented, uh, to have really this mainstreaming of poverty and inequality. If I could add, Maria, that. I think if there was one area of indicator development that would really make a difference politically, it's this area. And I think what Celine has said is really important that we need to have a granularity, which is different from what we currently have. Eh? And we have an expectation that by being able to combine information coming particularly from this Copernicus uh, source, eh? which has given us much more insights into natural system uh, characteristics with socioeconomic data, at the right level of granularity, then we could actually make uh, quite a difference. Uh, and, and our aspiration is that the 2020-2021 census, um, where about 10 years ago it was decided that postcodes so should be associated with um, people's responses. Therefore, you've got this geographical uh, information uh, system that can emerge from uh, the current, uh, the, the ongoing census. Uh, um, we expect the data to be ready in 2023. That would be a really interesting exercise to integrate that more socioeconomic uh, data with the environmental data that we have, uh, environment and climate data we have from elsewhere. Uh. Um, COVID-19 has made that a little bit more difficult because the census has been disrupted like many things uh, but by the pandemic. But I do believe that we could generate enough of a data set to really make a difference to the, um, to the discussion. And as I said at the start, I think politically it would probably be the number one, it would probably be the number one impact uh, indicator to, uh, to be bringing to the table now. Yeah, I, I might just uh, add to that, um, you know, um, in terms of uh, COVID, like the, the, the words we hear all the time is no one is safe until everyone is safe. So that's given us that uh, one planet, one home kind of perspective. Um, and what uh, I see, you know, this that when we talk about just transition, this there's like people, they pull back the fear of it. And we've seen it particularly in the center of Ireland, in the, the peatland areas where the government policy was to stop 
uh, the uh, burning of uh, the peat and now to uh, restore these uh, beautiful and incredible habitats and great uh, also in terms of carbon sequestration, but great for biodiversity. So, um, uh, but it, it's that fear of change is so uh, difficult. And I think uh, part of the problem we've had over the last number of years is that when we have um, different uh, like um, uh, climate advisory bodies or whatever, we forget the social scientists. So to manage that, um, that uh, and to support and help people to prepare for that kind of change. Um, and maybe, maybe the younger generation will be more prepared because they've come through this, you know, a, a COVID pandemic and that. But in any case, um, I think it is important that we, we, uh, we really uh, consider the, the emotion that the humans feel when it comes to having to change and that we cr create the mechanisms to support people, to enable people to be able to make the, the change that will be required. Well, I think this is a, a wonderful place to stop since it's already 10.15. Um, so once again, congratulations, Celine, uh, Eloise, for this uh, very insightful piece. Um, uh, thank you so much, Jock, Grace, for joining us today and everyone that joined in the chat. And uh, Celine, I don't know if you have any, any parting words uh, about uh, the next breakfast or anything that needs to be mentioned. Um, well, we have many more breakfasts uh, coming along, but I'm also very inspired by today's discussion, and I think I would say speed is the essence. Uh, but for me, the next step, building on the Green Deal barometer that uh, IEP has been doing, we would like to uh, you know, engage with stakeholders to really look at what could be targets, what could be indicators, look at all the pillars of the Green Deal, so we can inform and help contribute to the uh, ongoing discussion there will be around the ATNP and beyond. So I really look forward to be interacting with, with all of you uh, so that we, we, get the, 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 we get the progress at the right speed, right? We just need to make it happen and we have no time to waste. Wonderful. So thank you everyone and have a great day. Thank you very much as well. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you. Bye-bye.